Hello and welcome. This is the story of the Vikings in Greenland. A remote set of colonies where, for the most part, these people did not just survive, but they thrived. It was an important trade hub of traders, sailors and hunters, exporting ivory, rope, seals and even live polar bears. Whilst it imported wine, iron and stained glass from Europe, this civilization lasted around 500 years, from the year 1000 till the mid-1400s, where it met its mysterious and chilling end. At its height, it had hundreds of farms, manor houses and at least five churches, with a population of around 5,000. But by the late 1400s, every person had disappeared and nobody knew how or why. How did this thriving civilization come crashing down? And how did it start? Today, that's what we're going to explore. What led to its rise? What led to its fall? What would it have been like for these people to see the end of their world and civilization? This is the incredible saga of the Norse Greenlanders. In modern times, we see Greenland as a rugged, freezing and snow-covered land. But when our first explorers set out, the world was going through what was called the medieval warm period. So the southern parts of Greenland, still freezing, would have been filled with grass and trees lined in its southern fjords. Whilst further to the north, it was still harsh, snowy climate, inhabited by the Native American Dorset and Thule peoples. We get most of our information from these journeys, from the saga, Book of the Icelanders and the saga Eric the Red, a piece of epic poetry that would have been spoken out in long houses and mead halls in the long Scandinavian winters. We'll start a tale in the 1540s. A ship drifted off course in a storm and ended up in Greenland. The ship was full of Norwegians and it set foot on a beach in Greenland to discover a man laying face down in the snow, dead. This man was dressed in Inuit clothing with sealskin clothes and fur hood. But when they turned the man over, they found he had Norse features, red hair and pale skin. A Norseman, just like them. With the man was a knife, which the sailors took back with them on their journey. They must have wondered, who was this man? How did he get there? Was he trying to find a ship to take him away? And why did he die all alone, in the middle of nowhere, at the edge of the world? Europeans first became aware of Greenland, probably in the 10th century. These men were Northmen, Vikings from Norway. They had a terrifying reputation wherever they went in the world. They had already claimed Iceland by the 9th century, and by the 10th they had a dense population, with all the good farming land already taken up, and the few walruses that were in Iceland being hunted to extinction. Just as in Norway, the land was scarce for a growing population at the time. Slowly in Iceland, there were stories of sailors who had been blown off course by the stormy seas. These men had seen a new land further to the west, blue coasts and huge chunks of ice floating in the sea. In this culture of explorers, settlers and sailors, they must have wandered on their small island surrounded by the sea. What lay beyond? What new lands were out there to the west of the edge of the world? One of these men was Eric the Red. He was born in Norway. As a child, he was playing, fishing and living around the southern fjords. It must have fostered his adventurous spirit. But his father was found guilty of murder. So his family was banished to Iceland. By the time Eric and his family arrived, it would have been well populated, with the best land being taken. They only got wasteland in the northwest of the island, where the family set up a farm. When Eric's father dies, Eric inherited his father's farm and his bad temper. One day, when Eric was in his late twenties, he killed his neighbour over a dispute over the killing of some of Eric's thralls, thralls being the Norse word for slave. Eric chased the man down in a brutal fight and killed the man. In a time of family blood feuds, it would not only be the law Eric feared. After found guilty of murder, him and his family were banished from Iceland for three years. So, in the year 982, at the age of 30, Eric had little other choice. He built a ship and got together a crew, with those stories of the sailors who had seen that new land ringing in his ears. Eric sailed out west. The journey was about 1,500 kilometers, through storms, rough seas, and ice flows. The journey probably took him around two weeks.
Eventually, Eric set eyes on this new land of Greece. The eastern side mostly covered in ice. He sailed around the southern tip, finding a small sheltered cove with arctic grassy tundra. Trees of dwarf birch, juniper, looking the low-lying hills. In modern times, this would not look like a sensible place to start a settlement. For these hardy explorers, they offered a new life. Eric, in his own brazen fashion, named the cove Eriksfjord after himself. Eric and his crew continued exploring the western coast of Greenland for around three years, mapping it and plotting the ideal places for a settlement, living out Eric's three years of banishment. Then in 985, he went back to Iceland to try and convince people to join him in setting up colonies in this new, untamed wilderness. The sagas state that, in a rather tongue-in-cheek fashion, that Eric, giving it a good name, would make it more likely for people to settle, thus naming it Greenland. According to the Book of the Settlements, named the Landonbok, Eric managed to get 25 ships together for the journey, full of men, women, children. They took with them wood, nails, iron, chickens and livestock, everything they would need to start a colony. These people could have been rich enough to invest, thinking they would become even richer, become high lords of this new promising land. Or maybe it was the very poor, with very little good land to their name, hoping to strike out and better their lives. 25 ships set out on this voyage, but only 14 would make it to Greenland after days of hard sailing. The other 11 being lost at sea, the occupants being claimed by the cold northern Atlantic. For comparison today, this may be like space travel, trying to settle on the moon or Mars. But where only 18 people have died in space travel, countless more have died trying to make these voyages. It's impressive that any survived at all with their narrow draft longboats that were open topped and exposed to the elements. Iceland to Greenland was a far more dangerous journey than Norway to Iceland. With the freezing currents surrounding Greenland or stormy weather, huge floating icebergs had to wreck their ships. To show just how dangerous these voyages were, there's a tale in the Iceland sagas of a man called Loden. Nicknamed Lick Loden. Lick being the Norse word for corpse. Loden sailed the eastern shores of Greenland. He would gather the corpses of shipwrecked sailors who were stranded in the caves of the shoreline. He would often find runes carved into the ice or the rocks next to their frozen dead men, explaining their tragic fate for whoever may find them. The remaining 14 ships of Eric's journey set up two main settlements. The first being named Istvirket, which means Eastern Settlement, where Eric owned and which he had discovered years before. The other, Westvirket, the Western Settlement, further north up the coast. This is also mention of a Middle Settlement, but most believe this was just outposts of the Eastern Settlement. The Norse quickly made these places their home building farmhouses and fertilising the soil improving the quality of their crops and animals. Each farm kept a cow, which was regarded back in Norway as huge wealth. This provided them with lots of staples such as cheese, butter and yoghurts. In these settlers' minds this was their home, and where they were going to stay. In the western settlement, hunting was the main source of income, it was plentiful. The main trade to Norway being ivory from walrus tusks. These were one metre long and about five and a half kilograms in weight. These would find their way all across Europe, being much sought after. Every six years the Greenlanders would send their taxes to Norway. In the records of Norway in the year 1327, a single boatload of walrus tusks, around 260 in number, was recorded as the same value of 4,000 farms, showing the sheer wealth that was coming out of Greenland proving the huge wealth that was coming out of these colonies and their value to Norway and Iceland. They also hunted seal and polar bears for their pelts, and even took some live polar bears back alive to Norway. The settlers also hunted narwhal. 
They were interested in the narwhal's tusks. The cunning Norsemen, showing their trading skill, passed these off to less worldly Europeans as unicorn horns. They said they had healing qualities as well. These narwhal tusks made such a success they made it into the royalty of Austria, the number one power of the time. And even the throne of the Danish kings was made out of these narwhal tusks, or unicorn horns if you were to believe it. In the summer, the men of the colonies would make their way up north to a place called Disco Bay to hunt the huge quantities of walrus for their tusks, which they would sell to Europe as ivory. It must have seemed like endless bounties for these men, riches that they'd never seen before. In the spring, they would also hunt the caribou migration. They also built churches, which were built from the sandstone from the hills around the settlement. Religion still played a huge part to them on the edge of the world, stained glass windows and huge iron bells being brought from Europe. It must have seemed like a place closer to God, being so remote on the edge of the world, with the dark winters where the northern lights would shine brightly in the sky. How could it not have seemed like that God was looking down on them? Even the Pope took interest in the settlement, writing many letters about the welfare of the colony and their wish for the religion to be maintained. In 1126, the Roman Catholic Church founded the Diocese of Garda, which was subject to the Archdiocese of Nidaros, all the way back in Norway. The barns they made were made out of stone. One in Garda still remains today. Huge in size, it would have had the walls coated in soil and grass for the warmth of the animals. It would have had around 100 cows in it in just that one barn. However, because of the long winters where the cows would stay in the barns, the settlers would have to carry the cows out in the summer, as their muscles had all but disappeared in the long winter months. And as we know, all that is good does not last for long. The decline of these settlements was soon coming. Eventually, the settlers would discover they weren't alone on this land, finding skin boats and eventually people. These would have been at first the native Dorset people, and then being replaced by the Thull Inuit people later on. But they were known to the Northmen as Skraelings, in Norse word for barbarian. We know they were making contact by at least the 12th century, with a writing from Thorfinn Kalsveni, writing accounts of these unknown people he described them with large cheeks, strange eyes, and threatening features. How strange it must have been for these settlers to come across such a different people. One can only wonder what these first encounters would have been like. Would they have been curious, friendly, or even hostile? Relations between these two people were sometimes cordial, and other times less than friendly. With intermittent trading going on, and other times small battles, with death on both sides, an idea of how the fool felt towards the Northmen was in their folklore, the Northmen are just referred to as the enemy. There is clear archaeological evidence that in the 1300s the fool had moved so far south that they were on the same fjord as the western settlement of the Greenlanders. Granted on the opposite side of the water, but both cultures must have been nervously staring at each other out across the water. The fool were not a weak or a pacifist culture having armour made of hardened walrus, hide and bone harpoons as well. The Inuit being a hunting society may have come into conflict with the Norse over hunting grounds, or even hunted the Norse livestock, forcing each side into conflict. There is records that one Thul raid killed 18 settlers and took two young boys captive with them. But there is possible evidence of trade with Norse combs, chess pieces, and ivory carvings being found way up north in the Thul settlements, beyond the Norsemen. On the other hand, these could have been taken as part of a Thul raid on the Norse settlements. There is also evidence of Inuit language becoming somewhat intermixed with Norse, taking certain words of their own. This would not have been an easy or wholly peaceful coexistence for either culture to endure. The colonies themselves were never self-sufficient, soon running out of timber of its own, cutting down the trees in Greenland for their homes, boats, or for fuel for their firewood. It soon relied on imports 
and also of iron to make tools, nails and various other objects from Norway. Its lifeline was Norway and Iceland. Eric the Red's son, Leif Erikson, following in his father's adventurous spirit, made his own way to the Americas, what is now Canada, and finding places like Helluland on Baffin Island, where archaeologists now think there may be possible signs of a settlement there, as repair stations for ships on their way to the other colony Leif founded, named Vinland in one day Newfoundland. There would be winter camps set up there in later times that would harvest timber that would be brought back to Greenland, and possibly furs from lynx, bears and foxes as well. In the 13th century, there was a law passed in Norway that all ships from Greenland must sail directly to Norway with their goods, thus monopolising the trade for Greenland, further putting a strain on the wealth of the people there. So much so that smugglers routes appeared between Greenland and the Shetland Islands. With this, a lack of materials and money, in conflict with the Inuits, the Western settlement was the first to fall. There had been no word from the settlement for decades, so in 1341, Norway sent Ivar Bardason to investigate, as Norway hadn't received any taxes from the settlement since 1327. He was sent on this dangerous journey across the seas to find out what had happened to these people in a far-flung land. Why had nobody heard from them? Ivar Bardason survived the perilous journey to the eastern settlement. Upon talking to the people there, nobody knew what had happened to them. The people in the western settlement nobody had heard from in years. For context, these weren't colonies just down the road from each other. They were the size of countries separating them. A sense of foreboding and doom must have overcome Ibar, as he realised his journey was not going to end with a happy tale to tell. Ivar set off to the western settlement, and upon arrival found their houses and barns in ruin. The cattle and sheep still alive, but running free. No people, no bodies, and no clue to what could have happened to them, seemingly vanished off the face of the earth. There was no sign of battle, and with the livestock still roaming around, the inhabitants can't have been long gone. Whatever happened, can't have happened long ago. He carried on to four more farms that all shared the same fate. Livestock still there, but no sign of human life. Knowing the livestock wouldn't survive the winter without human care, Ivar and his crew slaughtered them and took as much meat as they could back with them. He reported back to the King of Norway that he thinks they must have all been killed by the native Skraelings. But in the back of Ivar's mind, he must have thought, where was the sign of battle, the burning buildings and the bodies of people? And would the Skraelings really have left all the livestock, all that good meat? It was a mystery, and nobody knew, and thus was the end of the West in Salmon. In the 1400s began a period known as the Medieval Cold Period, or the Little Ice Age as it was also known. It is debated what caused this, whether it was a solar radiation, or the Earth's tilt, or even a volcanic eruption. Or was it another event at this time, the Black Death, which led to a steep decline in the human population across Europe and Asia. Did this have an effect? Either way, it was so cold that the Thames River, London, froze all year round and people would skate on it, holding markets and fairs on the frozen river. Unfortunately for the Greenland settlers, between the years 1430 and 1455, it was the coldest temperatures recorded in Greenland for 2,000 years. This is known today by measuring the ice cores, with the temperatures being 6 to 8 degrees lower than today. In Europe, crops failed year after year. There was disease, mass famine, executions for witchcraft and war. As these God-fearing people tried to understand how this could be happening to them and why. In Greenland, the effects would have been even worse, with the colder summers and crops failing, and with little to no firewood to keep them warm in the bitter cold. The ground would have frozen all year round. Ice flows would have blocked up the fjords, not allowing ships into the harbours to bring supplies. Ice core studies suggest that there was an increase in sea salt in the ice over this period of time, suggesting violent storms throwing the seawater inland in the forms of sea mist.
With the trees being cut down, there was no protection against the cold, biting wind for the eastern settlement. The grazing soil had also been blown away by the bitter winds. A house in Vatnaburgi was swallowed by the sand dunes because of the wind. Whereas the Inuits were using seal blubber to light their fires for warmth, the Norse had nothing. The disturbing end to the eastern settlement was now well on its way. With this changing climate combined with the Black Death that had ravaged Norway, killing around 50% of its population. In 1349, the Black Death arrived in Bergen, which was the main port that supplied Greenland from Norway. These shipments virtually stopping to Greenland, the lack of population there would have been very few men to sail the journey, or even to make the boats to even go to Greenland. All in Norway would have been focused on their own survival. Imports of grain to the colony virtually stopped, and there was a mass shortage of iron, which for the people in these times would have used for everything, from nails to knives. This is shown in the archaeological records, with no nails being found in the top layer of habitation of the settlements. Knives were worn down so much they turned into stubs, so precious were they that they couldn't be thrown away. So desperate were the settlers becoming that they cut up their food with just the stubs of knives. Try to imagine being one of these settlers, seeing your forest disappear, having crop failure after failure. Hearing news from your homeland, your lifeline, that disease unimaginable in scale had wiped out half the population. And you, stuck on the edge of the world, no news coming to help you. Although, in one bright side, there was no evidence that the plague itself had reached Greenland. The settlers resorted to excessive hunting, eventually with seafood making up around 80% of their diet, compared to 20% at the start of the settlement. On these trips they would have had to take every able-bodied man they could, with not a man to spare, to hunt the seals and salmon and whale. They went further further up north, up the Greenland coast, as fish and seals got less plentiful. The ships that they would have had to use being a far stretch from the sleek longships of their forebears with virtually no wood or nails to keep the boats together. Combine this with even worse storms, whole groups of able-bodied settlers would have been wiped out by one wave, worsening the colony's position even further. Bodies in the church suggest at the time they began to be heavily malnourished, with stunted growth and teeth worn down by eating bone and poor quality food. Evidence of seal bone increases drastically in the settlement, showing that gone had the livestock and crops. In a chieftain's hut in the mid-1300s, there were deposits of caribou and livestock bones, but in a poorer farm only a few kilometres away, there was no trace of this, a poor family being malnourished, relying only on seafood. In 1378, the last bishop of the colony died, and no one was ever sent to replace him, showing how desperate the situation was and that they were being more and more abandoned by the outside world. And they probably felt abandoned by God too. However, in 1921, a Danish historian, Paul Norland, found human remains in the eastern settlement, Jorthelness, in a church there, which the bodies were dressed neatly, in the latest fashion, and even red of the cloak still being visible. Each body still had a Christian cross around their neck, and their arms were crossed in a religious fashion. So, even then, in what must have seemed the end of the world, they still get their belief in God. Papal records show the Greenlanders were excused from paying tithes, which were a kind of church tax from 1345, because the colony was suffering so badly from poverty, a fate the rest of the plague-ridden Europe rarely got. Combine all this with their most valuable commodity, ivory, from the walrus tusk it was being overtaken by Portuguese and Ottoman imports from deep within Africa. These elephant tusks were bigger and far better quality than those of the walrus, sending the Greenlanders' economy into a nosedive. The last written record from the Eastern Colony was in 1408 of a marriage in Helvasi Church, 70 years after the ruin of the Western Settlement. A marriage between Thorstein Olafsson and Sigurd Bjorn's daughter. This couple possibly seeing the end in sight, made their way back to Iceland soon after. Also, possibly showing the settlement's desperation, the burning of a man alive at the stake for witchcraft. But did everyone do the same as that young couple, leaving in a mass exodus for Iceland? The records suggest not, 
If there were hundreds or thousands of people turning up on your shores malnourished, starving and looking for a home, there would be record of it somewhere, but there is none. Seemingly, nobody knew of their plan. Archaeological digs show blowflies in Norse houses. These were often found with rotten and dead corpses, so it suggests that possibly there wasn't even enough people or they weren't strong enough to bury the dead. Chillingly, in one farmhouse, the remains of a dead calf and a pet dog, a Norwegian elk hound. Their bones been gnawed on and cut out with knives. How desperate they must have been to kill the young livestock and even more, their beloved family pet dog an animal that was also used to hunt caribou, so a vital lifeline for food. These people must have been so desperate that their future did not matter, only the here and now, the here and now survive and get food. In 1723, a Norwegian explorer Hans Egeda came to Greenland to find out the fate of the Greenlanders, hoping that he would still find some alive. So long had the contact been, he thought they may have gone into the old gods or turned to the Inuits for survival. So it seemed the outside world had no knowledge of the utter collapse and disaster of the colony. Hans only found ruins. On his arrival, he spent some time with the Inuits to try and find out what happened. He heard the Inuits' tales in their stories that they had passed down from generation. They showed Hans the ruins of the stone church, and he asked them, did the Inuits do this? They replied no, it was the settlers when they left. But where they went, they did not know. Another Inuit tale said that settlement was raided over the course of three years by Europeans, which destroyed the settlement. The full Inuits taken in the last of the survivors of women and children. But why do no records of the country show this? All over Scandinavian culture raids are talked about, and it's something to be proud of. But with Greenland there was nothing. So, after disaster after disaster fell upon the settlement, from famine, economic to collapse, war and disease, the survivors must have come to the point where they thought, what to do now? Do we stay and try and survive, or go and find new lands? Some believe it was the Northmen's own making that their demise happened. They did not adapt to their surroundings. They refused to take on Inuit culture, not using their fishing techniques or their fur clothing which would have been far warmer than the wool the Greenlanders used from their sheep. Some even suggest that they had a cultural aversion to fish, thinking themselves better than to eat it. I personally, along with other historians, disagree with that. The fact that the sagas mention salmon and fish frequently, and the fact that their religion, they would eat fish in a Friday. In Christianity, this would have been to please God, and we know that they were religious until the end. Also, back in Norway, their ancestors would have fished a little farmland to have. So this theory that the Norse didn't adapt isn't accepted by a lot of historians, and myself. Everywhere the Norse went in the world, they took bits of every culture, and to a certain extent, integrated. And if they abandoned all their customs, traditions, and everything that they held dear, what would that make them? Who were they? In their eyes, they would have probably just been more scralings. Others suggest that they didn't take care of their environment, not learning the lessons from Iceland. But again, we see the Norse fertilise their soil heavily, and take care of the population of seals they hunted. For example, they preferred to hunt the more difficult harp seal, which spent more time out at sea, instead of the harbour seal, which was more plentiful, and spent most of their time on shore. So what did happen to the last survivors of the eastern settlement? the all die in a mass starvation, as the archaeology suggests? Freezing and starving to death in their homes? Or were they killed by European raiders? Or by the full Inuit people? These being the most pessimistic theories. Or another theory being, with there no land being left in Iceland, did they go west again, a seafaring nation, exploring people, exploring culture? they set out again on an adventure? Did their ancestors like Leif Erikson, having gone to America, did they follow in the same path? With these tales still ringing in their ears, and it not long gone that shipping expeditions went to Vinland to gain timber, 
It's not hard to believe that the survivors tried their luck somewhere else, making new homes, maybe blending in with the natives, learning their lessons, or maybe met a violent end at the hand of the Native Americans. An interesting story is a tale of a ship being blown off course that had come from Greenland that had ended up in Iceland in 1347. The sailors said their destination was Vinland, a colony in America. So, did they try and settle somewhere else? Bishop Odson writes in the 17th century that the people of Greenland went with their own freedom and free will and lapsed from the Christian faith to the people of America. So there were clearly some back then that believed that they had gone to America. Let's look back at how we started this story. Of the man on the beach, a Norse man in Inuit clothing. Did he try to learn their ways and try to integrate into another culture? Was he the last one left of the Eastern Settlement? We don't know. Or did the Eastern Settlement share a combination of all these fates? Which possibly seems likely. The Norse Greenlanders, their fate, a large part unknown in the end. But the storyteller in me likes to think it was the last theory, that they left for pastures new. And like their ancestors, they kept exploring and pushing the boundaries of the known world. I think it's important to think looking at these stories. What would we have done? Seeing the collapse of our civilization, all alone at the edge of the world, with the ruins of our houses around us, our loved ones starved and buried around us, the northern lights over our heads, what would we have thought? What would we have done? Thank you very much for watching the story of the Vikings in Greenland. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please subscribe and like if you enjoyed it.